thank you all for, uh, for being here this afternoon. The book was written really to address what I think many of the people in the free world, in the, in the free market, kind of think tank world, struggle with. And this is kind of the, the dilemma that we face, the conflict, the paradox, if you will, that we all face. On the one hand, all of history, all of economic theory, but really, the last 200 years of history suggest that capitalism and free markets work. If what you care about is wealth creation, if what you care about is standard of living, if what you care about is raising the poor from poverty, then we should all just embrace capitalism. Free markets work. And they work everywhere. They work in America, they work in Europe. This city and this country now are a testament to the fact that they work in Asia. So the mystery is, the paradox is, why aren't we embracing free markets? Particularly in the West. Because in the West, for the last 80, 90 years, we've been slowly and systematically abandoning free markets, moving away from capitalism, and towards more and more and more of a failed system, the system of statism, where the state is the center rather than the marketplace and the individual. So, last 200 years, we've run a social experiment in the world. By the way, all you in the back, there's plenty of seats up here, so I'll wait if you want to come in and sit down. Seats in the front, they're all over the place. So for, two, for the last 250 years, we've been running a global experiment in what political, social, economic systems work, lead to prosperity, lead to human flourishing, and what political systems don't work, lead to human suffering, lead to death and starvation. 250 years, we've been running an experiment. We tried as close as we've ever come to pure capitalism. America in the 19th century, Hong Kong. And what do we get? Boom, explosions of wealth. High standard of living. Tens of millions of people rise out of poverty and achieve middle class. We tried the other side, pure statism, whether it's the Soviet Union, or whether it's Nazi Germany, and what do we get? Death and starvation. Destruction. Everybody poor. Nobody rises up. And then we've tried mixtures. We've tried some capitalism and some statism. The whole world today is this mixed economy. And, and some have a lot of capitalism and a little bit of statism. Some have a lot of statism and a little bit of capitalism. And we find the direct correlation, right? We find that places that have more economic freedom, again, standard of living go up, standard of living high, wealth creation goes up, the poor are doing better. And places that have a lot of statism, a lot of government, a lot of central planning, people are poor, standard of living is lower, so the correlation is right there in front of us. You can take, there's a, there's a publication that does the Economic Freedom Index, and you can plot economic freedom based on GDP per capita, and there's another correlation. So the question is, why do we keep moving towards more and more statism? In the West, granted, China's different, Asia's different, generally. You might be, might be, hopefully, have been moving in the right direction. But in the West, we're moving in the opposite direction. We're giving up on capitalism. 
more and more controls, more and more regulations, more and more taxes, more and more redistribution of wealth, less and less economic freedom, less and less individual freedom in the economic realm. This is not, in my view, a question of economic theory. We know why capitalism works. We've had great economists who've explained why capitalism works. We have great economists who've advocated for free markets. So history is on the side of free markets. Economic theory is on the side of free markets. And yet we move away from it. In my view, the answer is much deeper. The answer has to do with the fact that deep down, at a very deep level, at a, an emotional level, we resent freedom. We resent capitalism, we resent free markets. There's an almost instinctual response that's against it. And you can see it, for example, after the financial crisis that just happened, 2008, big financial crisis, right? What were the headlines of the papers? Right when the financial crisis happened, before anybody had time to investigate, to do the research, to study what happened, who caused it, who's to blame, what were the headlines? Capitalism failed. Free markets failed. It's all the fault of the free market. Before anybody had any time to even think about it, we already knew, deep down, we knew it had to be capitalism. Had to be free markets. There's something wrong with free markets they cause it. Now, I believe that in five, ten years from now, when economists have looked at what happened and looked at the data and investigated and had time to reflect, there won't be an economist who thinks that the free market caused the financial crisis. Because the free market, because the financial crisis, without a doubt, was caused in the United States by government controls government regulations, the central bank, all of it, the entire crisis, is the fault of government. And if you're interested in the details, ask me afterwards, I'd be happy to explain in great detail exactly what caused the 2008 financial crisis. It wasn't though, I can guarantee, free markets. Now how can I guarantee that it wasn't free markets? What do I mean when I say free markets? What do we mean free markets? Free of what? Free of what? Choice. What? Choice. Free choice. Yeah, we, we talk about free choice. So when we say free of markets, we're talking about free of controls that control our choices, free of regulations, free of government intervention. Free markets are markets that are free of government controls, government regulations, government interventions. In 2007, before the financial crisis, was banking in the United States free of government controls, government regulations? No. Banking was the most regulated industry in the entire country in America. In 2007, was the housing market in the United States free of government control, government regulations? No. If you know anything about it, there was Freddie and Fannie, and they heavily manipulated and controlled through government the housing market. So we can talk about what caused the financial crisis, but one thing is unquestionable. It wasn't free markets, because we didn't have free markets. Couldn't be free markets that caused it. And yet, again, the gut response was, that's what caused it. What caused the Great Depression in the 1930s? Well, if you read your textbooks, not just here in China, but in America as well, they'll all tell you what caused the Great Depression was Wall Street, free markets. Capitalism caused the Great Depression. But no serious economist, no serious economist believes that anymore. Because they've had time, They've reflected, they've studied the data, and now they know that the Great Depression was caused by government regulations, by the Federal Reserve, you know, Reed Milton Friedman, other economists have written extensively about all the mistakes government made to cause the Great Depression in the 1930s in America. But yet, we still learn 
there was markets because that makes us feel comfortable somehow. We don't trust markets. Markets are offensive to us. Why? What are markets about? Why do we participate in market? Why do people go into markets? You have to speak up because I'm... Yeah, they're out there. They go into the marketplace to try to make their lives better. Their lives. So Steve Jobs makes this what? Why? You gave a big plug for Steve Jobs. Good. Well, why did he make it? What was the purpose of making this? To make money, right? But it's not just about money. Money's important, but it's not just about money. Why else did he make it? What's that? Benefit to himself. Because this is fun. Right? Passion. He was excited about making this. He wanted to make beautiful things. But it was Steve Jobs who wanted to make beautiful things in the vision of Steve Jobs. He didn't ask me what I wanted. He didn't ask me how much I wanted to pay. This thing had profit margins over 50%. Very expensive. He made a lot of money. Because Steve Jobs produced this for Steve Jobs. And for Apple, and for Apple's employee, and for Apple's shareholders. But not for you, not for me. It was for Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was being self-interested, his interests. And when I, I like to joke that, you know, when I went and bought my first iPhone, it was 2008. The US economy was spiraling out of control. And I wanted to stimulate the US economy. I wanted to help my fellow man. So I went to the mall and went shopping and bought my iPhone. Because I know that's why you guys go to the mall, right? You go to the mall to buy your shoes and clothes because you want to make sure people have jobs. <laughs> you care about the Chinese economy and you want to help it, right? No. Why do you go to the mall? To make your own life better. Because you want those nice shoes. Because you want a nice shirt. You want a nice iPhone. For your life. For your self-interest. So everybody goes into the marketplace with the intent of making their own life better. Through exchange. Through trade. So the marketplace inherently is a place in which people are pursuing their self-interest. It's a place where we go and express our self-interest. And yet, what are we taught from when we're this big about self-interest? Now again, I don't know what they teach in China. I'm not an expert in China, but I can tell you what they teach in the West. Suddenly I can tell you what my mother taught me. I grew up in a good Jewish household, right? And my mother told me, think of yourself last. Think of others first. We are taught by our preachers, by our rabbis, by our philosophers, by our, all of our moral teachers. We are taught that nobility, goodness, virtue comes from sacrifice. It comes from living for others. It comes from doing for others. It's about putting yourself, your own interest aside and pursuing the interests of other people. We're, we're taught this. We internalize this. This is how we raise our kids. And yet the marketplace is a place that's the opposite. It's a place where people pursue self-interest. And that's, that's a con there's a conflict there. Think about the lives of, let's take a different entrepreneur instead of Steve Jobs. Let's take Bill Gates. Think about Bill Gates. Bill Gates builds Microsoft. He makes for himself $70 billion. That's his wealth. How does he make the money? By selling us products that we value. He makes all of our lives better. Every one of us who owns Microsoft product, our life is better for owning it. 
and the whole culture is better, the whole world, if you will, is better. Not a, not a single human being on the planet hasn't been touched by a product that comes from Microsoft. Hasn't been, their lives hasn't been made better. So he has changed the world, made the world a better place for almost everybody. How much moral, ethical credit does Bill Gates get for that? None. He's viewed at best morally, not as a businessman, but from a moral perspective, ethical perspective. He's viewed as eh, neutral, but mostly negative because how he's made seventy billion dollars. He's a greedy businessman. When does Bill Gates become a good guy? He starts a charity. Now he's not making money anymore. He's not trading value for value. Now he's giving his money away. So he's not benefiting. Now he's a good guy. Because there's no personal interest in it. Now he's still not a saint. He's still not a great guy. Why? Well, because he looks like he's having fun giving the money away. <laughs> So he's enjoying it. You can't enjoy being a saint. Sainthood requires suffering. So what does Bill Gates have to do if we want to make him a saint in Western culture? He has to give it all away. He has to move into a tent. And if he could bleed a little bit, that would help. But that's the perversion of the moral view that is held by most people in the world today. This is the view that morality is about sacrifice, that virtue is about self-denial. Not about building things, not about creating things, not about trading things. Those are all self-interested and therefore outside of morality. No, no, it's about giving. It's about sacrificing. And that's incompatible with capitalism. Bill Gates, the capitalist, is not a hero. Bill Gates, the philanthropist, the socialist, the redistributionist of wealth, right? He's redistributing his wealth. That we like. That's okay. So an ethical system that we have is incompatible with this political system. And when ethics and politics clash, when ethics and politics contradict, Ethics will always win. People want to be good. They want to be just. They want to be virtuous in their own mind. So they're willing to give up some economic freedom. They're willing to give up some wealth in order to be good. So when the politicians come to the people in America and say, look, there are poor people over there. We need to help them. I need to take some of your money and give it to them. People in America go, oh, okay, fine, take it. I owe those people the money. The fact that they are suffering is a moral obligation on me. My life doesn't mean that much. What matters is them. So, okay, I vote for increasing taxes. Rich people vote to increase their taxes all the time in America. All the time. Obama won the election in 2012 promising to raise taxes on the rich. How did the rich vote? If they only voted their economic interest, everybody rich in America would vote against Obama because he was going to raise their taxes. Eight out of ten of the richest counties in America voted for Obama. Now why? Because they feel it's their moral obligation. They feel it's right that their money be taken and given elsewhere. And they feel guilty for the fact that they're rich. If you live a particular life, a self-interested life, a productive life, where you're making money for yourself, but then you're taught that moral virtue is about sacrifice and giving and taking care of the poor and taking care of other people, and you don't do it, what is the emotion that you get from that conflict? Live one life, think good is another life. It's called guilt. Now guilt is a great way to control people. Ask any Jewish or Catholic mother and they will tell you that. 
It's an inside joke. You have to know Jewish and Catholic mothers. So guilt is a powerful tool in the hands of the politician in the West. And the rich or the middle class, the people who built something, who created something, can't stand before it. So we redistribute wealth to appease guilt because we morally believe it is our moral obligation to help others, even if we have to sacrifice our freedom, even if we have to sacrifice the hard-earned wealth that we have. Why do we regulate businesses so much? What is it that causes us to regulate every aspect of business? Control it, tell them what they can sell, what they can't sell, under what circumstances. What is it about business that forces us to want to regulate them? Well, we already know that businessmen are self-interested, right? But what do we know about self-interest? Or what do we think we know about self-interest? What are we being taught about self-interest? It's bad. And what kind of behaviors, what kind of behaviors are associated with self-interest? Well, when you, in the, in the schoolyard, when you point at a kid, another kid, and say, he's being selfish, do you mean he's taking care of himself? No, what do you mean? Yeah, he's hurting other people. He's lying, stealing, he's cheating. Right? Cheaters are self-interested. So when we think businessmen self-interest, automatically, inside our mind, because of the way we've been trained, because of the ideas that we've accepted, automatically we associated businessmen with thieves, businesses with crooks, businesses with cheats. You know who commits the most murders on American television? So like in the crime shows on TV, on the dramas, on television, on, in the movies. Who commits most of the murders? <laughs> Businessmen. Over 50% of all murders on American television are committed by businessmen. <laughs> in reality, one or two percent. On television, over 50%. Because we, we believe it. Deep down we believe it. We associate self-interest with murder and cheating and lying and stealing. So it fits. Now, if businessmen inherently, by their nature, are going to lie, steal, and cheat, then we better be worried. We need to control them. We need to regulate them. We need some government bureaucrat to look over their shoulder and make sure that they're not lying, stealing, cheating right now. We believe, as a culture, that lying, stealing, and cheating is inherent in the activity of business. So we assign a bureaucrat who is not self-interested, right? What's the interest of the bureaucrat? He's a public servant. He's there to take care of all of us. He's not motivated by his own interests. He's motivated by utility of society. So we trust him because, again, it's consistent with our ethics. Our ethics causes us to trust the public servant and to be suspicious of the businessman. So we walk into an elevator in the United States, you walk into an elevator in a building, and on the wall of an elevator there's a little, little uh, uh, plaque that says, this elevator was inspected by a government bureaucrat and therefore it won't kill you. Because we know that if we lead businessmen to their own dealings, they will build elevators that fall down and kill their customers. Because the best way to make money under capitalism is to kill your customers. Right? If we didn't have food inspectors, McDonald's would poison you. That's the assumption. That's the assumption. And markets cannot take care of this, we are told, because they're greedy, because they're self-interested. And self-interest is bad. Self-interest leads to vice, to bad behavior. So my view, Ayn Rand's view, was that as long as we hold this ethic of selflessness, as long as we place up as an ideal 
the public interest, social good, public good, other people's good, selflessness and sacrifice, capitalism will die. Capitalism will disappear. What she offers us instead is a different morality, a different ethical code. An ethical code, I think I heard Aristotle's name, so an ethical code, I think that has its roots in Aristotle's ethics. An ethical code both based on the idea that the purpose of morality, the purpose of ethics, is not to teach you how to sacrifice, is not to tell you what group you should be selfless towards, but to teach you how to live, how to achieve your values. An ethical system that teaches you how to achieve happiness, that provides you with the virtues and values that lead to success in life, to happiness in life, to human flourishing. A system of ethics that is focused on you as an individual and on your life and in making your life the best life that it can be, making your life a success as a human being. Such an ethical system, she believed, is the only ethical system consistent with freedom, consistent with capitalism. And I think, I think one of the challenges, for example, in China, is that the ethical system many Chinese hold is not this selfless, sacrificial ethical system that we so adore in the West, but it's a pragmatic pseudo-ethical system, because pragmatism is not ethics. It's what they teach in business schools in America. It's you do whatever you can get away with. Whatever works. Whatever works in the short run. Whatever works right now. However I can make more money. But this is not what Ayn Rand is saying. This is not Ayn Rand's idea of self-interest. She's saying, no, self-interest constitutes a set of clear virtues, objective virtues, that lead to a happy life, that lead to success. The principles that work in the long run, not just in the short run. So what are these principles? What do we have to do if we want to achieve a good life, if we want to live a flourishing life? Well, what is it what is it that makes possible all human values? What is it that allows human beings to be successful? Looking at history, looking at the world around us, what it is that allows us to be human and to flourish in this crazy world in, among nature, right? Because if, if you look around, you can look at your neighbor, if you look around at the people in the room, we're a pretty pathetic animal. We're weak, we're slow, we have no claws, we have no fangs. You know, if we run, run down a, a, a bison and bite into it, it's not gonna work. Saber-toothed tiger, human being, just on a physical level, who wins? Tiger every time. So what makes it possible for us to survive? What makes it possible for us to have survived the evolutionary pressures out there? It's our mind. Our ability to reason. Our ability to think. Every value that we as human beings have is a product of our minds. Think about agriculture. How did we invent our, anybody here have the gene for agriculture? No, there's no gene. There's no automatic way in which we discovered ag agriculture. Somebody had to figure out that a, a seed dropping to the ground and, be, and water on it is what source of a plant growing. That was, that was the scientist, the great Newton, Einstein of his day, discovered the relationship between a seed and a plant growing. I mean, we take it for granted. But somebody had to figure it out. And then the Bill Gates of agriculture was the guy who said, oh, I can, I can collect seeds, sow them, create agriculture, cut the thing and sell them on the open market. Right? 
So agriculture is a huge human achievement of the mind. As of clothes, as of everything we have, none of it is a product of just genes, of just instincts. We have very few instincts. None of them allow for the standard of living we have today. So for Ayn Rand, to be self-interested means to be rational, means to think, means to use your mind. Think, think, think. And thinking means thinking long term. Because what we're trying to achieve is happiness over a lifetime. You don't want to do something tomorrow or the day after tomorrow that sacrifices your long-term prosperity. You want to be able to live a whole life happy and successful and flourishing. So it's about being rational over the long term. That's what self-interest means. That's what taking care of self means. So, got to be rational. But you've got to take care of yourself, material. You've got to be able to make the products that are necessary for human existence. So you've got to apply your rationality to the problem of your material survival. So you've got to be productive. You've got to be able to go out there and work and create and build. Think of Bill Gates working, creating and building. He was productive. He was using his mind, using his reason to the problem of survival, to the physical problem, the material problem of how to survive, how to thrive. And he did a phenomenal job at it. So for I read Bill Gates' model, Bill Gates is a good guy. Steve Jobs is a good guy. Not because they give money away. Not because they help billions of people, which they did. But because they made something of their lives. They built something. They created something. They took care of themselves. They, they challenged themselves. They were giants. To be productive means to, to create the physical material that you need in order to survive. And the knowledge that you can do that, the feeling that you get from knowing you can take care of yourself in this world, gives people self-esteem, confidence, pride in themselves. Self-esteem is a necessary for happiness. You cannot be happy if you don't like yourself, if you don't believe that you can achieve things, that you can set goals and meet them. So self-esteem is necessary for human happiness. And I believe that therefore being productive is necessary for human happiness. You cannot be happy unless you're producing. You cannot be happy unless you have the confidence that you can produce for yourself, that you can take care of yourself, that you will not starve out there in nature. So when we hand people checks, when we provide people with welfare, we are not doing them a favor. We are destroying their lives. What we're telling them implicitly you cannot take care of yourself. I need to take care of you. You're too incompetent. You're too stupid. You're too whatever to take care of yourself. And what does that do to their self-esteem? They start believing this. They start thinking, you're right. I cannot take care of myself. I can only live with the help of other people. I'm completely dependent on other people. They can never be happy. They can never be successful in life. What you're doing by handing out the checks is you're destroying their lives. This is, this is what rich families often discover with their own children. If you have kids and all you do is hand them the checks, don't expect anything from them, don't require them to work, just hand them the checks. Then they turn out often to be rotten children, unsuccessful, unhappy. That's why 
in a lot of rich places in the U.S., you find drugs and alcohol and suicide rates very high because there's nothing to live for. There's no sense of pride. There's no sense of self-esteem because they haven't achieved anything in their life. Everything they've achieved is because of their parents. So self-esteem is directly tied to productiveness, directly tied to reason, to using our minds, to solving the problem of production. And then how do we, if we're self-interested, if we, how do we interact with other people? What's the relationship with other people? What's that based on? Well, that's based on what I may call the trader principle. The way to relate to other people is to trade with them value for value. The way to relate to other people is not to exploit them, not to take advantage of them, and not to allow yourself to be taken advantage of by other people. Not to sacrifice for other people, but not to expect other people to sacrifice for you. The way to relate to other people is through trade. I offer you a value, you give me a value in return. This is what we do in the marketplace, right? I offered Steve Jobs $400 and he gave me an iPhone. How much is the iPhone worth to me? More than $400. Otherwise, I wouldn't have bothered giving up the $400. How much is it worth to Apple? Less than $400. They made a profit. So who lost when I bought an iPhone? Nobody. Win-win. Trader principle is win-win. We both are better off at the end of the day. Rand says that should be the principle to get all human interaction. Not just in the marketplace, the material marketplace, but also in our friendship relationships. If you have a friend, and you're in, and emotionally and spiritually, all you do is give, 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 and you don't ever get anything in return, why are they your friend? It's not going to last. Friendship is a trade. You give, they give. It's not necessarily a material trade. It could be a spiritual trade, but it's a trade. Love is the same thing. Love can't be one-sided. It has to be two-sided. It's a trade. You're getting something out of the relationship, they're getting something out of the relationship. Something good. That's why it's love. So the way for people to interact is through win-win, value-added relationships. So Rand says, if self-interest is that, it's being rational, it's being productive, it's dealing with other people on the basis of the trader principle, then is self-interest related to, is there any relationship between self-interest and lying, stealing, and cheating? The self-interested people, are they, are they crooks? Does it make sense to lie? Is it in your self-interest to lie? Now most people say yes, and I'm sure half of you, at least, are saying, yeah, I sure it's in my self-interest to lie. And I would say, it's never in your self-interest to lie. You're cheating yourself and you're cheating reality. You're corrupting what's up here. Reason. Reason depends on what? Reason depends on facts, on truth, on reality. Lying is the distortion of facts the distortion of truth, the distortion of reality. There's a saying in computers, garbage in, garbage out. If you put inside here garbage, you get outside there garbage. And you think, oh no, I only lie a little bit over here. Oh no, your mind is an integrating machine. It connects everything. You can't separate the lies and keep everything else fresh and clean. It doesn't work that way. Lying is corrupting to your own ability to think. Lying always requires more lying. And you always know that the values you've achieved when you lied, you didn't make. You didn't create. You cheated. You faked reality to get them. And that destroys self-esteem. And self-esteem is required for happiness. It destroys happiness. I don't know anybody who's lied in life. I mean lied a lot in life. And is happy. They might be rich, 
We all know people who've lied and become rich. But money is not life. Life is not about money. Money is just one aspect. Happiness is not about money. Lying, stealing, cheating do not lead to human happiness. I mean, I am getting old and I can barely remember what I did last week. I have a hard time remembering what I did last week. It's a fact. Imagine if I lied about what I did last week. Now I'd have to remember two things. What I really did and what I lied. But actually I'd have to remember a lot more than just two things. I'd have to remember what really happened, what, I, what the lie is, who I lied to, who I didn't lie to, why I lied to some people, why I didn't lie to other people, when I lied, when I didn't lie, way too hard. It's way too complicated. It's a disaster. And I'm going to get caught. And when you get caught, what happens to that relationship, that trader principle, that value for value? What happens to your relationship with other people when they catch you lying? It's destroyed. In business, if you're lying, people won't do business with you. In friendship, if you like your friends, they won't be your friends anymore. It's a stupid strategy. It's an anti-life strategy. It's a self-destructive strategy. It certainly is not self-interested. And it's certainly not the way the market works in a free market. So if we can uncouple self-interest from lying, stealing, cheating, and if we can reject this morality of selflessness, of sacrifice, of living for others, then what we're left for with is a moral code for living your own life for yourself, for your own happiness, for your own success, by being productive and by exchanging values with other people. And this is a morality that leads inevitably to what kind of economic system? A capitalist economic system, a free market economic system. Somebody who has self-esteem, somebody who is being productive, is rational and pursuing his own ideas. Doesn't need mother government telling him what he can buy and what he can't buy, what he can eat, what he shouldn't eat, what drugs he should take, what he shouldn't take. He wants to make those decisions for himself. He wants to make the evaluation of what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. He wants to be independent, not a dependent on government not a dependent on some bureaucratic authority. So he pursues a life of independence and wants to be free of these government controls and regulations. So this morality leads inevitably to a free market if people embrace it, if people accept it. So my view in the book my view broadly is that if we care about free markets, if we care about capitalism, if we care about freedom, then yes, we need to make economic arguments and we need to study economics and we need to know economics and we need to explain economics to people. And that's all important. And we need to know history and we need to be able to know and explain and give examples about history and the success of capitalism. But none of that will work unless we can also change the fundamental moral beliefs of the culture around us. In the West, change it from this sacrificial altruism towards self-interest. Maybe in China, change people's attitudes from a pragmatism, anything goes, do whatever you can, to a principled view of morality of self-interest. If we can do that, if we can make this moral shift then the economics and the history and the politics and all that are easy. They're easy. So when we talk about a free market revolution, the revolution I'm talking about is not a political revolution, certainly not an armed revolution. It's a moral revolution. It's a revolution in the morality that we hold, in the, the fundamental ideas that shape our lives. And if we can win that revolution, then the rest is easy. Thank you all.
Uh, you said a uh, well, we need people uh, living the rational in long term. Yes. So uh, this is um, is, um, is re really uh, good uh, and uh, and make people all um, living uh, in a, a good condition. But uh, we know people are not always rational. We have some stupid ideas. Just so I want to eat a lot of McDonald's or something. But um, yeah, yes. In this kind of re um, reason, um, Aaron, uh, this uh, peop um, people believe in Aaron will, will force people to live in rational life. Well, uh, will this kind of things happen? Because they think this is most important. No, because. See, this is the point. If I believe that it's my moral responsibility to serve you, then what my whole focus is how are you behaving? Uh-oh, you're eating too much, so I'm going to force you not to eat too much. But it's my res you are my responsibility. But if I'm a rational egoist, if I'm a rationally self-interested, I don't care what you're doing. You want to eat too much? Your problem. Just don't come and ask for me to provide you with health care. Right? So the whole mental attitude shifts. If, when you're an altruist, then you're always thinking, why is he doing that? Why is he doing that? Or, or if we have socialized medicine, right? In China, you want to have socialized medicine, right? Now, it's my money taking care of you. So I'm worried. How much is he eating? Is he exercising? Uh, so I'm going to force you to exercise. I'm going to force you to eat well, because I have to pay for your health care. But if you pay for your health care, and I pay for my health care, I don't care how much you eat. You want to be irrational? Fine. As long as you pay the price for your bad behavior, and you don't force that price on me. So if I want to pay this kind of uh, responsibility, so I can do... So in my mind, this is rational. I just want to eat a lot, because in this kind of uh, life, uh, my happiness is most. So I can... Why we don't agree all our beliefs? This we're, is a rational life. We're not always going to agree on what's rational. And it, for some people, um, certain <laughs> behaviors are going to be rational, whereas for others, they're not going to be rational because we have different values, we have different circumstances, we have different experiences, we're going to come yeah. to different conclusions. That's fine. As long as you can't impose your views on me, then I don't care. So if some people donate his all money or donate a lot of That's money, fine. What I can say is money. this. I can say, I can look at you and say, what you are doing is irrational. And therefore, in my view, immoral. But it's still your business. So if somebody feels guilty, somebody in a free market feels guilty, and because he feels guilty, he wants to give all his money away and live in a tent and bleed a little bit and everything, I can look at that person and say, that's irrational, that's stupid, that's immoral. But he has a right to do it. You can judge other people. The question is, do you have the right to force them to do what you think is right? And I'm saying, no, you don't have a right. As long as they're not infringing on your rights, you don't have a right to force them. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I have a, a last uh, question? Uh, He's the uh, boss. You said if you give some um, money or you give check to other people, yeah. you destroy in life. Yeah. So uh, if, uh, you need to trade with them. Yes. Uh, you give something to them and they give you something back. Yeah. So you give us the uh, the lesson, the lecture to us uh, free. Yeah. And uh, do you think you are uh, destroy us? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm giving you the lecture free. Do I think I'm destroying you by giving you something free? It's not free. I didn't uh, manage to buy any Be But not all values are material. Believe me, I'm getting a lot out of this. And what I get out of it is a few things. One is your immediate response. I can see eyes, comprehension. I can see interest. That is very satisfying to me, right? But I expect things of you. I expect you to take these ideas seriously and to go out and to tell your friends about it. I expect that by talking to a lot of people like this, the world that I live in will be a better world. If I thought I was talking and all of you hated what I had to say, and you would never do anything about it, and you would go and live your lives as if nothing had happened, then I wouldn't give the talk. My reward is the fact that I hope
that have had an influence on you. So if I am a priest or a missionary, I give people talk about the Christianity, and if it lets them to believe in it, I benefit myself. So you, 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 you don't benefit yourself because you're actually leading them to a worse world, and your world will be worse as a consequence. So the ideas that you're advocating are important. If I'm advocating self-destruction, then I'm not helping myself. What, the way I'm helping myself is by helping you be better people, which I think leads to a better society, which benefits me long term. Look, there's also another aspect. I, I don't want this to be misunderstood. I'm not against giving somebody money if they really need it, right? So let's say you have a friend, and they've lost their job, and, and they can't find a job right now, and, and they, you know, they can't pay their rent, or something horrible is happening to them. I'm not saying if you give them a check, you've destroyed their lives. What I'm saying is if you make them dependent on that check, you would, but if you, I, I'm not against charity. People sometimes need help. People sometimes need something in the short run. Now hopefully you get something out of it. But it's okay to help people. I mean, is not about helping people, not against helping people, she's not against charity. She's against turning people into dependents. Where they, and particularly she's against turning people into dependents by forcing other people to support them. It's the force that is wrong. My question is very simple. How do you see uh, the conflict between freedom and democracy since many people think uh, democracy is a system that the majority bullies minority? Thank you. So whenever somebody starts off a question by saying it's simple, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so what do we mean by democracy? You know, it's really important. One of the things Rand taught all of us, of her students, is to, to, to clearly define what you mean. What do we mean by democracy? Democracy, in its original intent, means majority rule. It means we vote on everything. Majority rule is a form of tyranny. Majority rule is a form of tyranny. It's tyranny of the majority over the minority. And everywhere that it's practiced as pure majority rule, it's a disaster. And it leads to huge violations of individuals' lives, individuals' freedoms. The minority always suffers under pure democracy. My favorite story about pure democracy is from Athens, Greece, the first democracy. And in Athens, there was a great philosopher by the name of Socrates. And Socrates would go around and he would engage in arguments with young people. And the people of Athens were very worried because he would challenge the religion. And they said, ooh, Socrates is corrupting our youth. What are we going to do about it? Well, they realized the only thing to do about it was to kill him. Because you couldn't silence Socrates. This is his passion. So they got together and they voted. Right? Democracy. What should we do with Socrates? Kill him. 51% said yes. Right? Maybe it was 60, maybe it was 70, maybe it was 99%. Doesn't matter. He was a majority. So they give Socrates the uh, cup of poison to drink, to kill him. And Plato, his student, says to Socrates, you know, I've got a tunnel. We can escape. And Socrates, no. I believe in democracy. And he drinks the chalice and dies. You see, in democracy, there's no freedom of speech. There's only the freedom of the majority to determine what speech is. Socrates, they didn't like what he said, so they ruled him out. This is why, I saw 1776 in one of the slides, right? This is why the founders of America were against democracy. They established what they called a constitutional republic. They said, Minorities, by the way, what's the smallest minority? Individual. The individual. So they said individuals, minorities, have rights, have freedoms that no majority can take away from. For example, they have a right to speak, Socrates, right? they studied history. 
And no matter how many people vote to silence them, that's wrong. You can't do it. It's not de it, democracy doesn't work here. You have a right. I wish they'd said this. You have a right to property. You have a right to use your property. Do with your property as you will, as long as you're not hurting other people, physically, coercing other people. You have a right to do with your property whatever you want. Nobody can take that away from you, even majorities. So they had a Bill of Rights, they had a constitution that defined minority rights. They called it individual rights. And individual rights are freedoms. Freedoms of action. The freedom to act in reality to pursue your values. And no majority can take that away from you. So I am against democracy as majority rule. I believe in constitutionalism where constitution protects clearly, unequivocally, the rights of individuals. And then, yes, we can vote for our representatives, but the representatives can't do anything. <laughs> because we have this clear-cut definition of our individual freedoms. So in my view, government should only do three things. I mean, put it differently. In my view, government should only do one thing. One thing. And that is protect our rights. Protect our rights as individuals. And to do that, it only needs three functions. It needs a police force. It needs a military. So to protect us from crooks inside the country, to protect us from invaders who want to hurt us outside the country, and a justice system to arbitrate disputes. But government has no right to take money from some people and give it to others because I'm violating his rights. Right? What about his rights to his property? I've just violated his property rights. So I can't force him to fund some, somebody else. Governments have no right to tell you what kind of business you can or cannot open. They're violating your right to free action. As long as you're not cheating, lying, or stealing from somebody else in order to gain that business, none of government's business. So government protects us from crooks, from fraudsters, protects us from terrorists and enemies, it has a just a judicial system, and that's it. So I'm not an anarchist. I think anarchism is a disaster. It's the worst form of government, if you will, possible. Because there is no government, and what we turn into is, is a lot of force and a lot of destruction. I believe in government, but a small one, limited one, that only protects individual rights that have to be clearly defined and clearly articulated. So, it, it, democracy is a huge mistake. And, and what happened in America today, in my view, is we've gone from a constitutional republic in 1776, well, 17, when the Constitution was written in the 1780s, all the way to today where we are democracy. America is a democracy. So the majority votes to take money from the minority and give it to the majority. The majority votes that they want people to eat only this kind of food. The majority votes that people should only do this on Sunday. The majority gets to decide and it sacrifices the minority. That's wrong. Anybody else have a simple question? <laughs> <laughs> She's eager. Oh, light. Thank you. Um, okay, I have a, a question. Actually, I could follow his question because sure. Um, uh, I think uh, you mentioned a lot about the rational. Okay, you suggest people can be like more rational. Yeah. But I think you also have heard there's a uh, concept called behavior economy, which they go against the traditional economy theory that people are making decisions based on rational. Yeah. So I'm wondering, there's a lot of like um, suggestion or what you said, it should be applied only on certain contexts. I go back to what he said. He said sometimes, and I agree with you sometimes, like. Um, um, I don't care what, what you do as long as you don't push me to do the same thing like you do. But from as a Polish perspective, everybody are social animal. So we are not alone. We are like we, we need relationship with somebody and let's put to the extreme context, let's say, okay, you have this and you don't care about other people. So people are not willing to associate with you or actually you have a couple friends. I mean, as a human being, as a human being, I, I would still go back to say, do you feel it's kind of very, how do you say, it's kind of a, you change people to 
or the, the more like push, people will want to push them to be more rational. Actually, it changed to the direction that people become, let's say, inhuman. Because we know that extreme rational would only apply on the machine. Okay, because they never, so, they made, they never made a... No, I, I disagree. And partially, it's because, are you economic students? Uh, no, I'm no, not. Okay. But economists have a false view of rationality. The idea that rationality means never being wrong. The idea that rationality means knowing everything is wrong. That's not what rationality means. It's not what's been meant in the social sciences by the concept of rationality. Rationality means taking in the evidence that is available to you and using logic to come to conclusions. It doesn't mean you'll always be right. You'll be wrong sometimes. It doesn't mean you have to get every single piece of evidence because you can't. You have to at some point say, it's not worth my while to go and investigate over there. I'm going to make a decision based on what I have. It doesn't mean you're not going to have cognitive errors. Sometimes you do have cognitive errors like the behavioral economists. But what are the behavioral economists doing? They're teaching us the cognitive errors. And if we're smart, we'll learn from them. And we won't commit them again. This is the point, and again, Economics assume the world rational automatically. I don't. In my view, rationality is an achievement. It's something we work at. It's something you have to work at every single day. To be rational, which to me means to be self-interested, is hard work. And it doesn't turn you into a machine. It makes you passionate. It makes you excited. Because you know reality. You know the truth. You. There's no contradiction between emotion and rationality as long as you understand that rationality is the means by which you make decisions, by which you make choices. Emotion is the means by which you experience life. So you become more passionate. I consider myself pretty rational. I'm about the most passionate person you'll meet because it's, it, it, it's clarifying. It makes your emotions purer and you can are much freer to express them. So you live through your emotions, you experience life through your emotions, but you make decisions based on facts, based on reason, based on logic. And it's not this omniscient, omnipotent view that some economists have about rationality. That's not what I mean, it's not what philosophers mean when they talk about reason and rationality. In terms of human relationships, again, I'm not talking about being rational or being self-interested means living on a desert island. On the contrary, trade is good, right? I, I had the whole trader principle, value for value. And some of those values are emotional values. Love is an emotional trait. So it's about value for value, but being rational about it because, you know, sometimes you fall in love with the wrong person. And if you don't, and if you're not rational about it, you're going to screw up your life because you're going to be stuck with a really bad person. So you got it. Judge your emotions. You gotta watch over your emotions. You can't just give in to them. You have to be integrated. You have to be conscious. Okay, I, I'm sorry. Just one more. Sure. I really, sure. I, I don't. Sorry. It's difficult, but uh, okay. Let's put your theory into practice. Sure. We talked about government. We yep. talked about three concepts yep. that a government should apply at least. But uh, let's go back to China. And you say actually, um, the uh, when the rich people, they are willing to pay more tax. Okay, because of the the huge in America, I don't know about China. Uh, well, I mean, yeah. in China, I think yeah. it's a very similar situation. But let's say if government do not, let's say if government do not involve in this, and um, there's a, like what really happening in the world is like a huge gap between the poor people and rich people. And if we put it in the theory, okay, so the world is actually. I mean, the strongest species will survive, and weak, you know, species just naturally let them die. Yeah. Okay, if this is theory of to this, and also according to we talk about rights, and let's say in China, um, let's say the the kids, the I mean, like when they're born in different family, um, like a rich family or poor family, the poor family do not have the money to send their kids to the school. Okay. So let's say we have, yes, we have the same standard. We have a Gaokao, we call uh, college entrance examination. Yes, every school, I mean, uh, in the same cities, they take in the school, according, uh, I mean students, according to the same scores. But let's say the kids from the poor 
family, it's not going to fly. I get it. So look, uh, first of all, I don't believe that you just let people die, because that's not what capitalism does. Capitalism is the opposite. I mean, this is the mythology. The mythology is under capitalism, the poor die off and the rich become richer and richer and richer. But that's ridiculous. How do the rich become rich? By employing poor people, by selling poor people stuff, by, by investing capital with poor people who can then produce more. Take America, which is you know, a proxy for one of the richer you know, capitalist countries in the world, right? There are no poor people in America today. There are no, no, capital N, capital O, poor people in America today. If poverty is what you see in rural China, or poverty is what you see in Cambodia. Nobody in America lives without electricity. Cambodia, I've seen millions of people, well, thousands of people live without electricity. Nobody in America lives without running water. Why? Because we've created, the capitalist system has created so much wealth that they can pay poor people so much more money that they can now live in homes which in China are probably considered middle class homes. You know, poor people in America, 80% of them have air conditioner. They have cell phones. They have automobiles. Why? Because, the, let me put it another way. It's irrelevant, the relative status of people. What's important is the absolute level at which you are. How good your life is. Capitalism allows the poor to rise up and become the equivalent of middle class. Every example in history suggests this. In 19th century America, there was no welfare, there was no redistribution of wealth, there was very little charity. All those, and, and when the 19th century started in America, everybody was poor. Nobody had running water, nobody had electricity, there were no cars, there was nothing. Everybody was poor. By the end of the 19th century, based on the standard of living at the beginning of the 19th century, everybody was rich. And in the meantime, millions of poor people from all over the world came to America. My ancestors, Jews from the middle of Poland, who knew nothing, who had no capital, no education, they were poor farmers in little villages in the middle of Russia and Poland, came to America, and because America was capitalist, there were jobs, they could get a job, they could work, they could start a own business, and within a generation, they were middle class. Couldn't have happened in Poland. Couldn't have happened anyway. If you take China today and you get rid of your state-owned enterprises or you privatize them and you, God forbid, give people property rights over their land, real property rights, right? They own the land. And you let the market set prices and you let companies succeed or fail based on their profits and based on their merits, the Chinese economy will grow much faster than it's growing right now and the poor in China will become much richer than they are becoming right now. The more you redistribute, the more you take capital from the people who are going to invest in and create all this and give it to people over there, the more waste, the more poor people you will have, the slower the economic growth will happen, the less wealth will be created. That's what history teaches. That's what economic theory teaches. Freedom works. Uh, the ideology of free market is always invalid or weak to some battle nature, uh, just like greed, vanity, violence. At the same time, some smart people, many smart people, can manipulate very sophisticated systems to plant or steal wealth from others, uh, which is all, seems to like the, the rules complied with the ideology of free, free market. So my question is, how can the ideology of free market deal with or play against this stuff? So again, I believe that the ideology of free market has to be based on a solid moral foundation. Yeah, right. And that solid moral foundation says that manipulating people, stealing from people, is not right, is not moral, is not good. And that stealing from people politically, from a political perspective, is wrong, and therefore the state should ban it. So if you're a crook, the state should put you in jail. If you're manipulating the market in a way that's stealing from other people, the state should put you in jail. That is the one 
the only job of government is to actually do that. And if we can put the crooks in jail, then the rest of us are just free to produce and consume and live our lives. And that's a free market. That's the idea. That's how you deal with it. It's morally offensive, right? And it's politically wrong. It's both. <laughs> yeah. uh, how do you comment on Obama who yeah. forced, forced people to buy housing groups? I mean, and, it, and how do you comment on the super, Supreme Court rulings on Obama here? Super what? Supreme Court rulings. Supreme Court. Oh, Supreme Court. Court. I mean, um, Obamacare, there's a question about Obamacare. Obamacare is terrible because it's a step towards socializing medicine in the United States. It's, 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 we have in the United States today, if you have insurance, we have the best healthcare system in the world. By no, there's no comparison. If, if, if you're, um, you know, Berlusconians, the former prime minister of Italy, a rich guy, right? According to the United Nations, France has the best healthcare system in the world because they have a weird way of measuring these things, right? But Berlusconi gets sick. Does he go to Paris? No, he flies to the United States. I come from, I was born and raised in Israel. We have socialized medicine in Israel. My father was a doctor in the socialized system in Israel. Now Israel has really good health care. Why? Because they have lots of doctors. Why does it have lots of doctors? I don't know if you'll get the joke, but because it's a Jewish state. It has lots of Jews. Jews become doctors. So lots of doctors in Israel. Good doctors. Smart doctors. Right? But if somebody gets really, really sick in Israel, and they have the money, they fly them to the United States. Best healthcare system in the world. And Obama and a big chunk of the American people are dedicated to destroying it. In the name of equality. In the name of equality. What they want is an equal system of health care where everybody gets the same bad health care. I want an unequal health care system. The rich get better health care in America. No question about it. The rich drive nicer cars. The rich have nicer homes. They eat better food. That's part of the advantages of making money. But the poor in America still have a better health care system than the middle class anywhere else in the world. So the system is unequal, but good. Whereas equal is worse for everybody. So Obamacare is a step towards socialized medicine. It's a disaster. The Supreme Court basically ruled. This is the, the meaning of the Supreme Court ruling was. This has to do with democracy. The, the meaning of the Supreme Court is whatever people want, Whatever Congress votes on is constitutional. They're basically saying the Constitution doesn't mean anything. It's democracy. Taxation power. Taxation, well, if, if it doesn't work under taxation power, then you use the Commerce Clause. And it doesn't use under the Commerce Clause, you use taxation power. In other words, anything goes. The Constitution is meaningless, and that's what the Supreme Court has done. They've emptied the Constitution of all content. <laughs> Uh, I, I, Hi. Uh, I am Florent from France, but my question is not about the medical system. Uh, my question is about the relationship between growth and uh, inequality. Uh, you don't seem to like uh, to talk about or to think about inequality very much, but... Uh, uh, I'm, writing, I'm writing a book about inequality, so I actually like to think about inequality a lot. I, I would like to have your thoughts on... Uh, how to explain that uh, when we have low growth, which is not the case in China, which is not so much the case in the US, but which is the case in Europe, when you don't have a lot of economic growth, it's quite normal that the guys with a lot of capital will, uh, will uh, get more, and the guys working, waiting for growth, uh, are we going to wait a long time? You recognize maybe the word Piketty's uh, ideas there? Yes, yeah, so I, I recognize it a little bit of Piketty's okay. uh, so how ideas is too strong of a term. Uh, to describe what Piketty holds. Um, I think it's nonsense. I, I don't think the relationship exists. Uh, I don't think it's true. Look, there's no whiteboard yet. If you look at human existence, and, and you know, Piketty does a lot of empirics, but this is simple empirics that everybody knows. 10,000 years ago, 
Income per capita was about $3 a day. Average income per capita. And it stayed $3 a day for 10,000 years. And then something happened. That is, and during that period, by the way, the variation of income was almost non-existent. So inequality was zero. We had complete equality, and everybody was poor. Everybody made $3 a day. And then something happened. And wealth per capita, income per capita, on average, went like that. Like that. And at the same time, inequality went like that. Inequality is fantastic. Inequality is wonderful. Inequality is the sign that you are free. The only societies where you don't have inequality are unfree societies. The only societies where you don't have inequality are societies that use force on their people. Because the only way to make people equal is by force. My favorite example, my a simple example. Everybody know who Michael Jordan is? Famous basketball player, best basketball player ever. LeBron James, Michael Jordan, doesn't matter, right? How do you make me and Michael Jordan equal in basketball? I want to be equal to Michael Jordan in basketball. I think inequality is unfair in basketball. I want to be equal to him. How do you make us equal in basketball? I could train every day, all day, and never come close to Michael Jordan, right? So how do we make us equal? You break his legs. <laughs> but that's not going to make us equal. Because I'm really bad at basketball. You'd have to break his arms too. But you laugh. But this is serious. I'm not kidding. That's what equality means. The only way to achieve equality is to break people's legs. What do you think taxes are? So I work hard. And every dollar I make, 50% is stolen from me. 50%. Half of my life, half of my working life, is taken from me. I'd rather you break my legs. It's less painful. It's less destructive to my happiness. Give me my 50% back and break my legs. That's what equality requires. It requires breaking people's legs. Now, this myth about the relationship between growth and inequality. Countries that have high inequality, put it this way, there's no relationship. Inequality or, or growth is a function of economic freedom. It's not a function of inequality. Now what happens when you have economic freedom is you have high growth, and high growth leads to inequality. But if you, and if you leave those countries free, the growth will continue. And yes, inequality will continue. But so what? I mean, I think inequality is beautiful. We're different. I, I've got a PhD in finance. I could have gone to Wall Street made a lot of money. I don't want to. I'd rather do this. I have more fun. It's more enjoyable. And I've accepted I'm going to be middle class. I'm not going to be rich. Lots of us choose professions that don't involve making a lot of money. Life is not about making a lot of money. And in a capitalist economy, what is the difference between me and Bill Gates? Bill Gates, I think I calculated something, 10,000 times richer than I am. But what impact does that have on our lives? Right? Bill Gates drives a car. I drive a car. His car's nicer, but not that much nicer. It's a little bit nicer. If I have to get to point A to point B, I can get there, he can get there, same thing. He lives in a house, I live in a house. His house is nicer, but it's not that much nicer. I get all the utility I need from my house. Bill Gates flies everywhere in the world on a private plane. I do too. The only difference is I share my private plane with 300 other people, and he gets to fly alone. But the fact is, if I want to go to Paris, I can afford to go to Paris. I can afford to come here to China. I mean. The difference between us is not very big in terms of how we live our lives. How most Americans live their lives. So he's richer than I am. Now, part of the fallacy in Piketty is in how he defines capital and what capital means. He gets it all wrong. 
he, it's not, he's not even measuring capital. He's measuring some pseudo wealth number, but it's market wealth in places where there is no market. I mean, the whole book is one big, you know, error after error after error after error. And at the end of the day, what does Piketty care about? He says this, right? His solution to the problem of inequality is an 80 is a 10% wealth tax globally, globally. So every year, 10% of your wealth gets taxed away. And he says, look, this isn't going to help the poor because it's not that much money, but it's going to hurt the rich. Yay! What Piketty hates are the rich. What the people who talk a lot about inequality is they hate the rich, they hate the successful. It's not that they care about the poor. Because if you cared about the poor, you would be an advocate of capitalism. You'd be an advocate of free markets because never in the whole history of mankind has there been a better system for the poor than capitalism is. More people have been raised out of poverty through capitalism than through any other system. And China, right now, is an incredible example of that, right? Over the last 30 years, hundreds of millions of people have been raised out of poverty in China by the elements of free market that you've instituted here. Not by socialism, by capitalism. Hello, uh, you uh, talked about some government control. I've got uh, some questions. Uh, how do you look at uh, anti monopoly? Anti? Uh, anti monopoly, so antitrust. Good question. So, in my view, in a free market, in a truly free market, there are no such things as monopolies. If what we mean by monopoly is an entity that can charge any price it wants and provide any kind of quality it wants. And I'll take, take Rockefeller. We, we talked about Rockefeller. JD, Rockefeller was, had, at some point, I think he had 92% of oil, the oil production in the United States, the refining capacity in the United States. Now you'd say, that's a monopoly. Right? Now what do monopolists do? They raise prices and quality goes down. That's what Economics 101, we, we're taught. Right? But if you go to the records, you discover that Rockefeller reduced prices every year and quality of his product kept increasing. Why? There were a few reasons. One, he knew that if he raised prices, there would be competitors. One of those competitors was potentially Russian imports into the United States. Russia discovered oil, so there was competition overseas, but there was also competition. Those 8% would have grown, and he didn't want to take the risk. He also knew that as he lowered the price of oil and made the process more efficient, new uses for that oil would be discovered and he could make even more money. And the, the classic one with Rockefeller is, what did ultimately did we use oil, what did we use oil when Rockefeller had 92% of the market? For kerosene. But he made it so cheap that when the internal combustion engine came around, it was obvious to use oil inside engines and that was where he made his money later on. Who competed Rockefeller out of existence on the kerosene business? This is another fallacy that the government can tell what a monopoly is, right? So Rockefeller had a monopoly over lighting Americans' homes. Who competed him out of business? Thomas Edison. Electricity. So there are What's the term in economics? There are products that can replace your product that are not your product. So you might have 92% of your product, but there are alternative products that can do what you do. And if you don't watch it, even here when Rockefeller did watch it, there was a new product that replaced this. Alcoa in the United States had at some point 80 something percent of all the aluminum production in the world. Prices went down, quality improved. IBM. Was, was gone after for monopoly reasons because it, it dominated mainframes. But there were medium-sized computers called digital that competed with them, and then ultimately there was the PC that competed with them. Microsoft got into trouble for antitrust, why? Because it dared to offer a product for free, Internet Explorer. So in my view, there should be no antitrust. The market takes care of these things. If somebody abuses their power, their economic power, competitors will arise to deal with them. In a dynamic economy, in a dynamic model, 
I don't believe that controlling a huge percentage of a market over the long term, while you know raising prices is a is a can exist. It's dynamic. The new products, the new industries, the new things that are happening constantly in a free market. Thank you, Professor. Uh, you have uh, uh, talked about uh, a lot about uh, free markets, and uh, I, I just uh, wondering whether or not you have paid attention to the uh, Scandinavian uh, uh, countries. And uh, from my point of view, I see there's a very, very strong contrast between the American system and Scandinavian system, and uh, in terms of the wealth, wealth system. Yeah. So may you uh, yeah. So. This is a, a standard question. Let me just say, I find it fascinating. This is true in America and in China. Well, everywhere I give a talk. That even though my talk tried to emphasize that the issue is not economics, that the issue is ethics, all your questions are about economics. Nobody's asked you a question about ethics, which is interesting, something you think about. And I think because we were a little uncomfortable talking about ethics and we don't have the language, we don't know exactly how to do it. But let me answer your Scandinavia question, because I always get that question. It's another one of the standard set of questions you get. Um, first of all, America is richer than Scandinavia. <laughs> standard of living in America is much higher than in Scandinavia. We live in bigger homes on average. We, we drive nicer cars on average. We have, uh, you know, we, don't, we, we have more air conditioning than them, but they don't need air conditioning, right? Because they live in Scandinavia. Um, I always tell my, my friends, let's run this experiment. Nobody, nobody takes me up on it. Let's open the border. Let's lower all immigration controls between the United States and Sweden. Anybody want to guess which way the traffic will go? All the Swedes will move to America, not the other way around. But then people tell me, but Swedes live longer. Life expectancy in Sweden is higher. Swedes also, in surveys, are happier than Americans in surveys. Interesting, right? So Sweden must work because they're happy and they live longer. But what's interesting is, if you look, if you look at life expectancy of American Swedes, they live the same length as Swedes. So if you control for genes, there's no difference. And if you ask American Swedes how happy they are, they're at least as happy as Swede Swedes, if not more happy. The happiness surveys, all this happiness stuff, it's got all to do with culture. If you're Swede and somebody asks you, are you happy? You feel guilty if you say no. You're supposed to be happy. If you're Jewish and somebody asks you if you're happy, you feel bad if you say yes. You're supposed to complain. I live in a culture where all we do is complain. We can't be happy. It's wrong to be happy. So let's take economics. So the welfare system. So Sweden is a great example. During the 19th century and early part of the 20th century, Sweden was one of the most capitalist countries in the world. It had some of the most successful industries. It created some of the greatest wealth ever seen. And that accumulated huge amount of wealth. And then in the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, they turned to socialism. And they started redistributing the wealth. And they created a lot of wealth, so there was a lot to redistribute. They kept redistributing, and, they, and industrial production went down, wealth creation went down, um, uh, productivity went down, but there was so much wealth that they could still continue distributing. Until about 1994. And in 1994, Sweden was bankrupt. So what did they do? They started going away from the welfare state, away from socialism, and they started liberalizing their economy. And for the last 20 years, Sweden has been heading towards more capitalism, just as America has been heading towards more socialism. And it's becoming more and more capitalist. And that's why Sweden is doing relatively well. It's not doing great, but it's doing relatively well, because it's reversed the socialist policies of the 60s, 70s, and 80s during the 1994 crisis that they had. They had a huge debt crisis. And today, the economy is doing okay. It's not doing great. It's just doing okay. Uh, but given everything else in Europe, it's relatively good. So the welfare state doesn't work in, Switzerland, in Sweden. It, it's still bankrupt the country. Uh, it's just doing a little bit better than the rest of the world. And, you know, it's just a matter of time. It, it went bankrupt once. It'll go bankrupt again. 
Um, and in terms of the quality of life there and the standard of living and everything else, as I said, it's, it's lower than the United States. And it's very much tied into culture. Sweden's a very homogeneous country. It's very simple. It's very easy. There's one language. It's very small. I, you know, again, if you lived in Sweden, you want to go to the United States. I don't know many people in America want to go to Sweden to live. Visit, maybe, but not to live. Because life is better. Yeah, so this may be lead to the question that you mentioned about the passive system with the, with the long system. Because in the early part of the Because in the what? I mean, in the early part of the world, they may have the different uh, asset system. For example, like the Scandinavian uh, area, they have their own uh, asset system, they have their own PDs. And uh, when we put the, those uh, free market things in a different part of the world, we can see that the free market tend to be, uh, to be becomes totally different things. For example, like the, the free market in China it's really become something not really that we expect before. No, I mean, I, I don't think that's true. I think if you look at the pockets where there are real free markets in China, they look exactly like the pockets of free markets in 19th century America or Swedish free markets in Sweden in the, in the early part of the 20th century. It's, it's, what you have to do is abstract away all the other stuff that's going on. But in terms of the dynamics of the actual working in the markets, it's the same. I don't, but there's an interesting question, I think, behind what you're trying to ask. And that is, maybe different people, different things make happy. I mean, I'm claiming that I have all knowledge about what makes human beings happy. And I, I think there is objectively truth about some things make people happy and others don't. I mean, Aristotle talks a lot about this in his, in his ethical theories. There's only one path towards real happiness, towards real human flourishing, towards real human success. I think I don't know that Aristotle would agree with what I, what I think, but it's the path of reason. He'd agree with that. Uh, productiveness. He wasn't big on productivity because, you know, in those days, they didn't understand economics. So what it took to, to, to sustain life. So being productive being, and, and being a trader, like we talked about. That is the path to, to human happiness. It's a path for Swedish happiness, African happiness, Chinese happiness, Jewish happiness. It doesn't matter. Now, there are other cultural factors. When I said the Swedes have this attitude towards happiness and the Jews have it, those are subjective, those are subjective things and, and they're wrong. Most of them are wrong. I mean, Jews shouldn't be apologizing all the time. Right? Swedes shouldn't be overconfident. We have to be rational. Rationality requires fitting to reality, fitting to what's really true. She wants, she's very patient. Speaking of capitalism in China, uh, actually a lot of scholars, academics have raised the idea that the China, what China is running is running an actual crony capitalism. Is what? Crony capitalism. capitalism. Because uh, if entrepreneurs, if they want to make it big, uh, they need to strike all sorts of you know deals, sweetheart deals with the government officials. So will this kind of crony capitalism eventually destroy the real assets? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is a question about China being crony capitalist. So let me first, just in terms of uh, a terminology, I hate the term crony capitalism. There's only one capitalism. It's about free markets protecting individual rights. Then there's statism. Statism always involves government and business interacting. So cronyism is a characteristic of statism, not a characteristic of capitalism. Capitalism is the negation of cronyism. It's when there's no government intervention in the economy. So it's a negation. So let's call it cronyism. Yes, I think much of China's economy is crony. And I think much of the uh, achievements in China are, are, are ways in which businessmen have gotten around the need to be crony, because you have to be, you have to deal with government. So the bribes, the, 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 you know, the, uh, the finding ways around regulations, and so on. And then there's the real crony. Well, then there's going to the government to give you monopoly power over something. That's real monopolies. When the government can come in and kill your competitors or, or, or destroy your competitors. That's a real monopoly. And there's, a, there's obviously a huge amount of that in, in, in China. And yes, um, 
that will destroy whatever elements of true capitalism there are unless it's reined in, unless it's stopped. A mixed economy, when you have a mixture, either moves towards capitalism, which means getting rid of the cronyism, or towards more statism, which means destroying that part of capitalism. China is at an interesting crossroad. It could go in either direction. And that's the big question you guys have to answer. That's the big question you guys have to fight for, is which direction should it go? Should it go towards more capitalism and therefore destroy the relationship between government and business, destroy that cronyism, or will it go towards a greater intensity of that relationship and towards, in a sense, backwards? Um, the United States is facing the same issue. America is becoming more and more and more crony, more and more and more statist. More and more businesses make money by getting favors from the government. And it's a huge battle in America today. It's a huge battle all over the West today. And it's a question of will we move towards capitalism or away from capitalism. That's the real challenge. Um, I'm reading a book about China right now, uh, which I'm finding fascinating and I would recommend. I think it's in Chinese. It's Ronald Coase's book on how China became capitalist. Now, I don't think China is capitalist, so I think that's a wrong title, but how did it get to where it is today? It's fascinating, because he's saying, I'm just in the beginning, so I don't know exactly what he says, but he's implying that what he's saying is China really, the real progress in China were in those areas that the government wasn't paying attention to. So those, what he calls marginal, at the margin of society, at the margin of the economy, that's what really grew fast, where there was pseudo-private property, where there was pseudo-free markets, that's what grew fast. And that the, the part of the economy that the Chinese government tried to manage, where there's clearly cronyism and everything, that is the part of the economy that grew the slowest. That is the least responsible for the, for the huge uh, growth in wealth and, and in production in China. So it's, a, it's, it's really interesting, so I would recommend, I'd recommend that book by, by uh, Coase, and I forget his Chinese co-author. Wang Wang Li. He wants to ask again. Do you think the Ren and the Ren or Ren had came, this kind of philosopher can live peace with uh, uh, Christianity? <laughs> Another simple question. That's uh, what's that? That's ethical. Yes, it is. No, it's a good question. I love the question. So do I think that Ayn Rand's philosophy can live in harmony with Christianity? Uh, ultimately, no. No, Christianity upholds a moral code, which is the exact opposite, in my view, of objectivism. Think of the symbol of Christianity. The symbol of Christianity is a man bleeding while being tortured and dying on a cross. For us. For our sake. The s What's that? Not well, let's not, let's not deal with theology. It's a man. Every saint, every saint in Christian mythology, every saint in Christian history, if you ever watch the, the paintings of, um, I can't remember the name of the saints, with the arrows, all over him, or the, you know, every one of them get torn apart by lions. Every saint has suffered, horrible, horribly suffered, and that's what makes him a saint. Horrible for what? For who? For him. Pain is objective. Pain is objective. There's no, I, if I stick a needle into your stomach, you're going to be in pain even if you Whatever you believe, you're in pain. Pain is objective and pain is anti-life. All of these saints are sacrificing for us. Their life gets meaning only from their sacrifice to us. Now, yes, that's being selfish in this sense. They're being self-interested in this sense. That they believe there's an afterlife and they're going to be rewarded for it in the afterlife. But when I say that to Christians, they say, oh my God, no, my saints are not self-interested. God forbid. The whole point is that they're sacrificing. 
That's the essence of the moral code. The moral code is the subjugation of self. But look, this is true of all religion. Objective is Ayn Rand is saying, you're responsible for your own life. The purpose of your life, the purpose of your life is your life, is you. Christianity says your purpose of your life is not to serve you, is not to be happy, is not to be successful, it's to serve God. It's to serve a server being more important than you. Don't have pride, say the Christians. Don't have pride, because you're nothing as compared to God. Read the book of John, my favorite book, I, I've read the Old Testament because we studied it in school. Read the book of Job, my favorite book, my favorite book in the Old Testament. Everybody know the story, anybody know the story of Job? Now some of you do, right? Job is the successful, prosperous, happy guy. He has a family, he has a wife, he has a thriving business. He's doing fantastically well. And God looks at him and says, I'm going to test Job. He kills his wife, he kills his children, he destroys his business. Job now is no family, everybody's dead, no business, he's suffering, he's, and he's angry at God, and he yells at God, and he screams at God, and he's really upset and everything. Why? Why are you doing this to me? And God comes out to him and says, none of your business. None of your business. Who are you to ask me why I'm doing this to you? You're nothing. You're nothing. Your job is to obey. It's to live your life quietly without asking questions. And towards the end of the book, Jeb says, you're right. I have full faith in you. I will never question again. So God gives him a wife and new kids and a new business and everybody lives happily ever after. But the essence of religion, of all religion, is to obey. And that's why we invented religion. The priests, I mean, there are two reasons we invented religion. One is to explain our ignorance. We didn't understand why the River Nile kept rising when the tides subsided. So we said there's a God in the River Nile that does that. We didn't understand why the sun goes around the earth. Oh, it turns out it doesn't. But we didn't understand that, so we had the sun god, and we had a moon god, and we had a river god, and we had this god, and that god, to explain all the things we didn't understand. And then Judaism came about and said, ooh, we can innovate. We can have one concept that explains everything we can't explain, we call it God. And yes, now we understand the tides, but we don't understand molecular whatever, so we'll call it God. Everything is God that we don't understand. So that's one reason, an epistemological reason. Help to explain the world. But the second reason is control. If I am the head of the tribe, I invent a God and tell all you guys that I'm the only one who talks to him. And truth comes from God, morality comes from God, all this stuff comes from God, but guess who it's really coming from? Me. But that's great. I'm in now in a position nobody can hurt me. I can establish the truth. I can tell you what to do. You all live for the sake of the tribe because I tell you what to live for. So it's a great way to control people. In my view, those are the two purposes of religion. Free people. Don't want to worship some entity that never shows itself. That there's no evidence that it exists. Free people want to serve themselves. And want to deal with facts, with reality, with logic, with rationality. Not with mystical stuff. And they don't want to be controlled. They don't want to have a Pope or a Mullah or, or, or somebody who communicates with the, afterlife, with, you know, with the other sphere. And they don't want to live for an afterlife which doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. And you know how I know it doesn't exist? Because nobody can prove or nobody can provide one iota of evidence. Iota. All I want is an iota of evidence that it does. So by default it doesn't. The burden of proof is always on those asserting the positive. If you believe in an afterlife, it's on you to prove it. Since you can't prove it, there's no afterlife. So. I don't think the two are compatible for moral reasons and for epistemological reasons. Reason is the ultimate value for you man. Religion, Christianity, all religion require faith. Require the negation of religion at some point or another. Uh, 
Uh, I'll ask some moral questions. Good. <laughs> Uh, for example, uh, as, as I mentioned, we can do it wherever, mostly wherever we want, uh, just in case if, if we didn't hurt anyone, right? Yep. Uh, but Not morally. Politically, you can do whatever yeah. you want. Morally, you can't. Yeah. And, uh, you know, human beings used to hunt a lot. Yep. And a lot of uh, animals extinct. And yep. I'm not sure uh, how that. Oh. Okay, so what is the morality about killing animals? I mean, my view is... It, there are two issues. Politically, let's do politically first. Politically, it depends who the animals belong to. So I believe in property rights. Animals out there in the world should own property. They belong to the property owner. So you can't kill somebody else's animals unless they give you a license to do it, a permission to do it. By the way, the way they're saving elephants in Africa is giving private property rights over elephants in Africa. So people have an incentive to grow elephants because then they use them for hunting. But there are more elephants because they're being hunted. Which is counterintuitive, but completely true. Morally, I believe that there's no reason to shoot an animal, to kill an animal, a living being, something that has value, unless it's for a purpose. For example, to eat it. Unless you need to eat it. So the purpose of the, you know, of, 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 um, so morally, I think it's offensive to beat a dog up or to treat, to mistreat an animal. I think it's morally wrong. Even though politically, I don't think the government should intervene if it's your dog or if it's your animal. Now, what about extinction of animals? If you really like a certain animal and it's going to go extinct, then buy some and protect it. But if I don't like the animal, and it's going to go extinct. And I'm not going to, don't, you can't force me to buy it. Right? So you like spotted owls in America? Buy a forest, put some spotted owls on there, and preserve them. But don't force me to preserve spotted owls on my territory. So I think that, I don't think you have, we have an obligation to preserve species. Uh, but uh, we used to hunt for, like fox for their fur. Yeah. And, uh, I'm not sure it's not perfect, you know. I think it's fine to hunt fox for the fur. I, I mean, uh, every piece of clothing that human beings used to have before we invented, we had cotton and wool and so on, was from an animal. Wool is from an animal, right? Uh, wool still is from an animal. Um, I mean, it's from an animal. So there's nothing wrong with hunting animals for the sake of clothing. As long as it has to have a human purpose. It's, you're not just doing it for fun. You're not torturing an animal for fun. Then I think it's moral. So, but do we have to do that right now because we have the clothes right now and some people are actually hunting for fun, you know? Yes, I, that wrong. yes because I think that, um, uh, I don't know, fur is beautiful. There's no reason to deprive yourself of something beautiful because of an animal. Animals don't have rights. And in the end, nature and animals are there to serve us, not the other way around. We're there to, I mean, the way human beings survive, this is... The way human beings survive is by exploiting their environment. This is the argument against the environmentalism. Animals adapt to the environment or die. Humans adapt the environment to themselves. So if it gets cold, we go chop down trees and build a hut. We burn wood in order to create a fire. We kill animals to, build, to have furs to keep us warm. We change the environment to fit us. So anything that involves using animals or using land or using trees to fit our purposes, when it's a legitimate purpose, I think morally is okay. Uh, but is there is an edge between uh, between this? And I thought there should be a balance point, you know, the global warming, for, uh, global warming stuff like that. Okay, so let's talk about global warming. Yeah. Now we're moving away from ethics again. <laughs> So, I'm not a scientist. I don't know if there's global warming or not. I'm suspicious. I'm skeptical. Why am I skeptical? Not because I understand the science. I don't. But because the same people who claim there's global warming going on right now used to say that there was global cooling going on and it never happened. And before that, they said that we were going to have too many people and everybody was going to die of starvation and that never happened. And they've, they've got a bad track record, and I'm a finance guy. If you come to me and ask for an investment and you have a bad track record, I don't invest with you. So that's why I don't trust them. 
Okay, but put, it, put that aside. Let's assume there is global warming. And the world, the, the, the world is getting warmer, right? So, so to get warmer, you know, Canada will become habitable. <laughs> Think of all that part of eastern Russia that nobody lives there. We can all move there. I mean, we'd have to get rid of Putin, but other than that, <laughs> people will migrate because of weather. We've always migrated because of weather. Nothing new. Florida floods. People will move out of Florida. It's sad. I'm not happy about it, but so what? Stuff like this happens. You know what worries me when it comes to climate? What worries me is global cooling. That is, what worries me is the next ice age. We know, we know there's going to be an ice age. There has been, there will be, these things go in cycles. But when, when, um, you know, when New York, when the glaciers reach New York, that is very hard to deal with. Much harder than warm. Uh, I had a professor once who said, global warming, if you really believe in it, buy air conditioning stocks. <laughs> Again, we adapt the environment to us. So if it gets warm outside, we create more air conditioning. For example, here in this room, the air conditioning has to be a lot stronger if it gets a little bit warmer, because it's already pretty warm, right? So we need, we change, we, we develop technologies. The other thing we do, let's say it's going to be catastrophic. The solution can never be stop industrialization, don't build fuel, don't drive, don't build stuff, don't create stuff. That can't be the solution. So let's think, could we put something in the atmosphere to help cool it? Could we develop a technology that mitigates the effect of CO2, a chemical? I don't know. I'm not a chemist. I'm not a scientist. But the orientation of the thinking should be, how do we solve the problem without killing ourselves? Um, another way to think about it, I, I once heard a, a presentation by an economist by the name of Kevin Murphy, Chicago economist, brilliant guy, one of, one of my favorite living economists out there. And Kevin did this analysis, and he said, let's assume, let's take this book, this book written about how horrible climate change is going to be over the next 100 years. And he said, let's price it out, and let's do a discounted present value of the costs, and see how much money should we have invest today to prevent this catastrophe 100 years from now. And it turns out that you should be investing exactly zero. Because if you take into account economic growth, and you take into account that 100 years ago they're going to be much richer than we are today. And if you use a proper discount rate because of the uncertainty that will actually happen, you're much better off waiting and, and investing the money later on when we're much richer. And the way he described it is, what they, what, what they want us to do today is to tax poor us, who are poor, for the sake of rich future generations. Another way to think about this, just in the old experiment, in 19th century Europe, take London, they were burning a lot of coal. You guys burned a lot of coal, right? And there was a lot of soot in the air. And it was, it was, it was hard to breathe, it was very bad, real pollution, worse than Beijing and Shanghai. <laughs> Imagine if environmentalists then had managed to ban coal for the sake of future generations. No industrial revolution, none of us would be here, none of us would have been born. If we would have been born, life would have been miserable and horrible and awful. The fact that they bore that pollution allowed us to become rich and get rid of it. The same is true with global warming, if it's happened, which I doubt. I live on the edge of the desert in California, so I'm going to be affected. So, you know, I might have to move. Uh, but I've also got a lot of air conditioning. <laughs> professor. Hello, uh, Professor. So, uh, during the presentation that you mentioned about the uh, inconsistency between the answer systems and the prompt systems, so you propose that uh, probably the ethical revolution is the solution, right? Good what? Ethical revolution? Ethical revolution is the yeah, solution. Yeah, it's the solution. Yes. So how exactly you think about it? How do you get an ethical revolution? Yeah, yeah, can you implement it? 
education, 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 and no shortcuts. You have to explain it, you have to get people to read about it, you have to get people to think about it. Ethics doesn't change by fiat. Ethics doesn't change by osmosis. Ethics changes by people thinking, by changing the value system. It takes a long time, it's not quick, but it's education, education, education. Change happens slowly. But, but, uh, but do you I have to convince people. Are yeah. you to succeed or fail? Do you see like the culture scenes is quite different in a different part of the world? I mean, culture scenes. So if you want to build up like new, new kinds of uh, ethical system in the world, in a different part of, of the of I don't the world. think it matters what world. I, I think, let me just say, I think China is actually a, a pretty good place to do this because from my perspective right now you guys don't have an ethical system because I mean in this sense in this sense in a sense that you're not Christian you're not judo Christian tradition you don't have that Confucius has a certain element of ethics and it's kind of dated and I think I think capitalism has kind of superseded it and I think China's looking for something I think there's a void and I think in that sense, there's a great opportunity in China to bring these new ideas to fill that void. Whereas in America, I'm constantly fighting against the ingrained altruism of Christianity. Constantly up against that. I think in China, it's more, why take the ethics seriously? It's about, let me do whatever I want to do, right? And I think that's an e in some sense, that's an easier battle to fight. Do you support child labor? Do I support child labor? This might sound like an uh, outrageous question, but let me put you on. No, no, it's not an outrageous question. It's a good question. Um, yeah, go ahead. In China, they have those mountainous regions. Uh, there are a lot of poor families, the poor children. They never uh, got the chance to receive education. But somehow somebody brought them to the city, and the, they worked in a factory, and they got decent housing and stuff. And somehow in the future, the property they could get a, a chance uh, to be educated, at least to get some trade, to get some trade. But um, at this time, uh, from whistleblower reported to the government saying yep. that they're using child labor. So these children will be sent back to the, they are all those backwaters. So um, do you think this is good or bad? So I, I support child labor. In this sense? In the sense that, yes, in the sense that I think child labor during certain phases of development is necessary because the alternative is starvation or at the very least stagnation. And uh, I think in the 19th century in Europe, parents couldn't afford to send their kids to school. Kids had to work so that they could eat. There was no wealth to redistribute even if you wanted to redistribute it. So wealth had to be created. And this is true of many very poor places in the world. If you deny children the ability to work, they will starve. What do they do? What do children do, by the way, before capitalism? What did children do before capitalism? They worked. From sun up to sundown, all day, in the farm, on the land. Child labor has always been with us. The thing that eradicated child labor the thing that got rid of child labor is capitalism. Because once you reach a certain level of wealth, no parent wants his kid to work, so they send him to school. But how do you get that wealth? From capitalism. So it's the exact opposite. People always tell me, oh, but capitalism creates child labor. And I say, no, it's the opposite. Capitalism destroys child labor. Child labor, I, I mean, if you read the Bible, if you read history, if you read everything, if you, if you go and, and look at a 16th century farm, if you look at a 20th century farm in China, children worked in a farm. They had to, otherwise they couldn't eat. So child labor is part of life that, that capitalism eradicated, like slavery. People say, ooh, capitalism created slavery, and I go, really? That's, uh, uh, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of, you read this all over the place. Capitalism created slavery. Have you ever read the Old Testament? 
or read the Greeks, slavery's always been around. And when did slavery disappear? When did slavery disappear? In the 19th century, at the height of capitalism. And who, who got rid of slavery? The socialist countries? No. Who got rid of slavery? The British and then the Americans. The two most capitalist countries in the world. And they fought. I mean, in America, 700,000 young men died in a war to end slavery. So slavery went away because of capitalism. Capitalism is the anti-slavery, anti-child labor system. You know, I tell people, uh, it, you know, if you're wealthy enough, if, you know, in a, in a, how, how many of you want to manage a bunch of 12-year-olds? Nobody wants to manage 12-year-olds in a factory. That's why child labor disappeared, because children are not productive. Do people join the Tea Party equals to the charity? Do people join Tea Party what? Equals to libertarian. No, Tea Party is not libertarian. Tea Party is, is traditional conservative in America. It has an element of libertarianism, but it's not libertarian. It's much more conservative than libertarian. Yeah, and then I think we'll wrap up. Uh, yeah, one last question. Uh, you complain about a lot of about government and a lot of about uh, tax. Uh, but what about public service? And, you know, we are in a... Uh, railway station, and you can buy yourself a car, you can buy yourself a bike, you can not buy yourself a metro. You know, we're not from Dubai. I don't know why not. That is, uh, why can't private enterprise build a metro system? Uh, but we can see in the British... Uh, in the United States... Uh, the, original, the original subway system in the United States was built by private enterprise. The, the original parks, you know Central Park in New York, the big park, was private. Uh, it was a bunch of businessmen, bought the land, turned it into a park, handed it over to a non-for-profit to manage, and it, it, it was a private park. So, they, in my view, there are no public services other than police and military and a justice system that private sector cannot provide cheaper and more effectively than the government. And I don't think so, uh, because in, the, you know, in the Britain and I used it in the Canada, and the transportation system is based on you know public and by the government. And sometimes, uh, and uh, in a uh, specific period, the private company uh, take over it, and the price get really ridiculous high. Yeah, but because because of the way it was privatized, this is in England, and the way they privatized the railroads and everything, it's not real capitalism. Again, now I can't show you, but I have this parallel universe somewhere, right, where. England state capitalists that never reverted to socialism and all the public transportation in England was privatized. <laughs> and if I could show you that, you'd see that they're much better than what they have today. Uh, and of course they resist privatization, even though they pretend. I'll give you an example. All these countries in Europe are resisting Uber, which is a form of privatizing public transportation. And it, 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 Uber would destroy the, private, the public transportation system, the, the, the buses and the uh, license-based taxis in, in London. And it would be a lot more efficient and a lot cheaper. That's why they oppose it. And in China, there's sort of uh, stuff like Uber. <laughs> but, you know, uh, in China, there are three companies. We call it BAT, Bad, Baidu, Alibaba, and uh, Tencent. And Tencent, they just... Uh, in the China, there's uh, uh, Uber, you know, uh, Cobier, we call it Da Hong Fong, and uh, they used to be the first one who got the, the apes on the phone, and they're totally destroyed by uh, Baidu and Tencent, and they, caught, they, they just threw up millions of uh, dollars just to destroy them. Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't know the China case, but in the United States, we have the equivalent of Baidu and Alibaba and all that stuff, Google, Apple, uh, Yahoo, whatever. Uh, Uber is thriving. It has multiple competitors now. Not only is it applied now to taxis, but if you want to go and stay in, the, in an apartment in New York, you can use now something called Air, Air B2B, which is where people are renting out their own apartments. Through, I mean, it's amazing what this technology allows getting around the regulation. In every way, the regulators want to shut this down. It's, and other companies can try, but the main way in which it gets shut down is through regulators. I think we're going to stop here. Thank you, everybody.